Catholics are an important part of the American story. America has been strengthened by hardworking Catholics. From New York to California, the Catholic story is truly unique, and it's a great story. From marching for civil rights to educating millions of children, serving the poor, and helping define the pro-life movement, clergy and lay Catholics across the country have made countless contributions to the American success and the American success story. Washington politicians have been hostile to the church. They have been hostile to Catholics. They have been hostile to the members of Catholicism. My administration will stand side by side with the American Catholics to promote the values we all share as Christians and Americans. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. We will make America great again. Our country is in serious trouble. We don't have victories anymore. We used to have victories, but we don't have them. They're sending people that have lots of problems. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. Their rapists said, we need to build a wall, and it has to be built quickly. And I don't mind having a big, beautiful door in that wall so that people can come into this country legally. But we need, Jeb, to build a wall. I'm not going to pay for that fucking wall. He should pay for it. He's got the money. Yeah, get him the hell out of here, will you please? Hello. Rick. Hello, you're caught coals. Don't get burned over there, man. <laughs> Whoa, what's going on, man? Uh, I was so anxious to read this book that yesterday I couldn't help but reading a few pages of what's going oh, to come. Is that right? Let's and see. I have a problem since then because ah. I got a yearning to get this out. This is so wonderful. Okay, you good. Know. So let's go into it right this away. So don't wonderful. say another don't, word. Save it for you, the broadcast. <laughs> you Fair don't enough. even need to make you don't even need to make a big introduction. You can do that now and you can take the recording from the very first word on. That exactly. That's original. what I was thinking too, Yerk. So that's uh, just Welcome, yeah, everybody, just... to an, another edition of Code Word Barbalon today, uh, and it's the 13th of February, right, Yerk? It is the 13th of February, 2018, yes. Mm, thank you. A Tuesday. A Tuesday. And I have been so blessed with so many things, I can tell you. Great. Just a little bit that has nothing to do with Cold World Babylon, just a minute. I told you, I think, in one of the last broadcasts that I got a letter, that I got a package from Germany from people from Frankfurt who I've never even known about. Oh, yes, that's right. Yep, that's correct. And they sent me some papers about, uh, you know, this book of Luther and the Jews, eh? because Luther allegedly wrote a book about the, uh, the Jews and their lies. Yes. At the end of his life. And yes. I always I always was of the opinion and of the conviction, actually, um, that this book must have been a forgery. It cannot be that Luther, who had such a wonderful biblical understanding, of course, here and there he had still a little bit Roman Catholic leaven in his body until he died. But for the rest, he was so in his biblical oh, understanding, so very well learned. Very profound, I, very profound. Yeah, that, that, that I thought this is not possible, that he writes a book about the Jews and their lies, and that is, of course, then used to start anti-Semitism, especially in the Third Reich, mm, you know? Yes, yes. And by that, of course, they have something, they have something to defame Luther and to put the Reformation and Protestantism uh, to uh, to pull that into the dirt, yeah. Because that's always what they mm -hmm. seek to do. So I got this paper from these people in Germany, and uh, where it says that there is a Jewish person, a, uh, a a Jewish scientist called Eva Bernd, which is uh, who who lives in Berlin, um, that she said that this anti-Judaism of Luther is probably built on lies and deceit and forgery. Now, the papers they sent me are not very informative. Uh, and 
you really cannot say by reading these papers, oh yeah, she's absolutely right. It has to do with uh -huh. Luther's understanding of history. Uh -huh. And Luther, Luther, in, in, in his understanding of history, he wrote a paper in 1541 that is called Supputatio Anorum Mundi. Um, that that has to, that, that that is about um, you know the understanding of how old the world is and everything else. And I did a lot of research just on this paper alone this afternoon, and um, I was on there for for an hour on the internet until I found that paper. Um, or I, I found a dissertation on that paper. I, I even found a paper from a German professor, which uh, whose name is Siegfried Hermle. He uh, put this paper together in 2008, and I'm going to read that in completely in German. It's in, in a PDF. I made it in 31 pages. It's about Luther and the Hebrew language. It's about uh, what, what he did in all his life, how he explained... Um, the Old Testament, how he explained the New Testament, how he made comments to all this, um, and so on and so on. It's really a very long paper. The interesting mm -hmm. thing is the very last mm -hmm. paragraph of mm -hmm. this paper mm -hmm. says something in um, – I, I, I'm sorry, this is – it is so important. I, I have to try to get um, – to get to Google Translate right here, right now, live on our broadcast, and uh, try to uh, translate that to you as good as Google Translate allows this to be. Yeah. So it says here, for example, on the basis of three remarks in the Supputatio, the paper that I just meant, Luther's understanding of history is also briefly pointed out. The year 3960, at which the birth of Christ is terminated, marks at the same time annus, uh, annus unus salutes, means the first year of salvation. And he always gives references. This is in Luther's works, uh, volume 53, page 124, and so on. I'm leaving this, those out, but you can believe that everything is sourced. Yeah? Yes. And to the year 4960, so a thousand years later, at the same time, mille salutis is noted quote, and this is in Latin, finito estu millenario solvitur nunc satan, et fit episcopus romanos antichristos, means after this millennium, meaning the birth of Christ, 3960 to 4960, after this millennium is finished, now Satan is untied and the Roman bishop becomes an antichrist. With regard to his presence, Luther noted on the last page of the tables, Hoc Allo 1540, listen to that year, 1540, Hoc Allo 1540, numeris anorum mundi, precisi et 5500, quares sperandos et finis mundi, nam sextus millenarius non completibur, which means this year, 1540 is exactly the year 5500 from the world. So the end of the world is to be expected, for the sixth millennium will not be completed. According to Augustine and Bernard von Clairvaux, Luther saw himself in the last, the third epoch of the time of the Messiah, well, the same time that we are today, after the Roman authorities first persecuted the young Christian community and then heretics and pseudo-Christians attacked the church, it was now, listen, the time of decay came from within. The time of decay of Christendom or Catholicism is the way that I understand that. Yes, yes. yes. Satan, Satan again mobilized all forces and powers. Papists, infidels, Muslims, Jews, heretics, and rites to one last major offensive to overthrow the gospel and with, uh, and with it the true church of Christ. That should be resisted. Unquote. That is that very last paragraph of that paper that I found. Oh, yeah, and I guess yeah. after you hearing me this list, uh, reading in English, you understand why I am so baffled with this. Sure. Oh, yeah. The it's last... like this book I pulled out of the dustbin of history yesterday that 
you can't find anywhere. Yeah, yeah, from James Same Atkin White, yeah. Same mm-hmm. thing. Just jaw dropper, eh? Yeah, you know, it, it says here, the time of decay came from within. Satan again mobilized all forces and powers. So when we understand, as this is written here, mm-hmm. he puts this in the year 1540, which is the year of the mm. ordination of the Jesuit order. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Wow. Satan again mobilized all forces and powers. Papists, infidels, Muslims, Jews, heretics, and rites to one last major offensive to overthrow the gospel and with it the true church. R-I-T-E-S? Yes. Oh, yuck. Isn't that just wonderful to read yeah, to read yeah. things like this in oh, the absolutely. understanding yes. that, that we are doing this book here, reading uh, Code World Babylon, mm-hmm. and this book teaches us all about the Jesuits, and here from this German guy in the very last sentence we read that we are living in the time that now Satan, even to Luther's understanding of the whole timeline that he set on the world, that we are, according to him and his time, living in the last 500, maybe 600, maybe 700 years mm-hmm. before Jesus Christ will return. And I think we all agree, all Bible-believing Christians, all creationists agree that we are living in the end of the 6,000-year circle. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. And then this author says here, Satan again mobilized all forces and powers. Yeah, the Jesuits. Mm-hmm. He mobilized the Jesuits. He mobilized all powers those, those people most of the time see. The papists mean the popes, and the papists mean the followers of the popes. The infidels, meaning the atheists, people who don't want to have anything to do with the word of God. People like Chinese, people like Japanese, people like you know, living over there in Asia, nothing against those people personally. No, it's they the heritage. Never, it's the, but it's... they have never learned of the gospel. They are savages. Yeah. yeah when you yeah, read it's... what happened in the World yeah. War II and other yeah. uh, other times of the uh, of the, of history with the Japanese and the Chinese when they made war, we cannot even imagine the atrocities they have oh, begun. Oh, look, because... you know, listen, I went to Bible school some years ago. You know, of course, it was an ecumenical joke, and I got out of it right away. But I did meet a uh, a fellow from Japan, very friendly young man, and I, I was roomed right next to him. You know, I had a, a room right next to him. And I'll tell you, one time... um. I woke up and I was hearing this screaming and I realized it was him in his bed, just screaming. And the next day I come up to him and I says, Hey, are you all right? I I heard you screaming last night. And he looked at me really funny. Is that wasn't me. It was really weird. But, uh, I kind of came to the realization that, um, there's much more to it, Yerk. <laughs> I don't have a clue. That is, you know, the interesting thing, Brett, is that we learn every day more and more and more. The more we we get busy with the truth, the more we study the Word of God and everything around it. And mm-hmm. by around it, I mean things like Cold Word Babylon and doing research on ourselves on these things. Mm-hmm. The more we do that, the more we get a more complete picture every day. That's right. And every day I am just stunned. Mm-hmm. Why didn't I see that the day before? Why didn't I see that three months ago, six months ago, a year ago? It is so, all of a sudden, it all becomes so clear. And really, Brett, I thank mm-hmm. you so much that you came to the table, and let's sure. today maybe do an, a, a broadcast of an hour and a half or something. Yeah, because you know, at about six o'clock, that is in two hours from now, I have to go to dinner anyway. Right. Otherwise, let's maybe put this broadcast in two parts. I don't know, but let right. us go starting on chapter twelve: unhesitating obedience, the general and the holy office. This is such a wonderful obedience. work. Obedience. Yeah. 
on All page right. 120 we are going to start. Please. And yeah, dear listeners, I yesterday I took a little bit of time and I read a few pages because I was so intrigued about the title. And I thought I want to read a little bit about this and I just couldn't lay the book aside. I read right. about, I don't know, eight, ten pages maybe. I couldn't care, even in bad light, it was almost midnight. I was... I was bound to that book. I just couldn't let it down. I couldn't lay it down. Sure. I sure, really please. had to go into it. Go ahead. And this this is why I'm going to read to you right now from page 120 of Code Word Babylon, The Sons of Loyola and Their Plans for World Domination. We begin with a quote that reads in the original, probably um, Latin language, Copiae faciunt haut minus ac isui faciunt, which means in English, they do just as they are ordered. Means they only do as they are ordered. Not they do just, they mean do righteous, they do only as they are ordered. This is what that means. And then there comes a quote from Benjamin Disraeli, who was a uh, if I'm not mistaken, prime minister in the in England in the end of the 19th century. And he quotes, I can assure you, gentlemen, that we have not, uh, we have to deal, you know, sorry, I can assure you, gentlemen, that we have to deal not with emperors and cabinets alone only. We must take into consideration secret societies who have agents everywhere Determined upon uh, de determined men encouraging assassinations and capable of bringing about a massacre at any moment. Unquote. This is from Benjamin Disraeli. Now, P.D. Stewart starts in the book on page 120. The power of the general of the Jesuits is incredibly great, even greater than that of the Pope himself. In locum dei teneti means holding the place of God. The Jesuit constitutions expressly enjoin every member of the order to see the general as vicarius Christi, the representative of Christ, that is to, quote, acknowledge Christ as if he, in capital letters, were present in the person of their general, unquote. You know, that is a difference that yeah. you have to see the general of the, uh, of the society of Jesus as Jesus Christ, uh, if he was Jesus Christ in person, that is different than to see the Pope as the quote-unquote vicarius filidei, the placeholder of Christ on earth. There is a very profound difference on that. And you will See, dear listener, I will not go into many comments during this reading because this reading explains itself. It doesn't need my comments very much. Mm -hmm. But this is a really a point that we have to understand very well. So I'm going to read the sentence again because it is so profound to understand. I was just going to say the same thing here. Could you repeat what you just said? <laughs> I'm a little slow this morning, here. <laughs> The Jesuit constitutions expressly enjoin every member of the order to see the general as Vicarius Christi, the representative of Christ. That is, to, quote, acknowledge Christ as if he, in capital letters, were present in the person of their general, unquote. For this reason, the Jesuits refer to the general as the Black Pope, or his gray eminence. Thus, although the Jesuit takes a vow of obedience to the visible Pope, meaning the white Pope, you remember the fourth oath of induction, it is to the general that every Jesuit owes his first and utmost allegiance. Says Chalotet, the French lawyer who read their constitutions, quote, in not fewer than 500 places. And, dear listener, you probably remember that I broadcast and broadcast and broadcast ago told you that within the constitutions, at least at about 500 places, this occurs. Here we have confirmation, because here it is quoted from Chalotet 
re, uh, his report on the constitutions of the Jesuits in page 62. We read from Charlotte, in not fewer than 500 places in the constitutions are expressions used similar to the following, quote, we must always see Jesus Christ in the general. Be obedient to him in all his behests, as if they came directly from God himself. Unquote. A similar Latin title, Vicarius Filii Dei, means representative of the Son of God, is also used to address the Pope, speaking of the White Pope. Interestingly, vicarius, from which we get the word vicar, is an adjective meaning that which supplies the place of, its Latin root being vicis, v-i-c-i-s, vicis or vicis, which means alternative or in the place of. Hence, when used as a noun, vicarius means substitute for while in the Greek, vicarius is translated as anti, A-N-T-I. Thus, the title vicarius Christi is used by the Jesuit general can be translated as anti-Christi or literally, literally in the place of Christ. Likewise, the Pope's title vicarius Filii Dei translates, translates as, quote, in the place of the Son of God. This is much too important to be brushed over here, and so I have devoted an entire chapter to its analysis. But we have digressed somewhat. Returning to the plenary power of the Jesuit general, after Loyola's passing from the field of action, a certain Diego Leonis succeeded him as general. One of the very first acts of the new general was to assemble a congregation at which he caused it to be decreed, quote, Solus proepositus generalis autoritatem habet regulas condendi, which means the general only had the right to make rules. That means that only the general had the right to make rules. He has the right to make rules. Consequently, the whole order, with all its authority, is comprised in the general. Every Jesuit that you see is a representation of the general because he does only the will of that general. You get it? You get it, Brett? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Whenever you see a member of the Society of Jesus, you see the general. You know, because I have that so photo of uh, Hans, Peter Hans Klovenbach there at Hans the Hans Peter Klovenbach. Yeah, yeah at the J Church of the Jesu in Rome. Um, behind that altar, or in front of the altar there, you know, staring at the camera. You can see it in his eyes, man. That guy. <laughs> he knows a few things. I don't think he's going to tell us about him either. I'm he's not gone anymore now, because of course. He's deceased, yeah. yeah, he's gone, of course. <clears throat> but, I mean, you could tell from that photo. I mean, it's just like, wow. So obvious. For those that have eyes to see. Please, Jörg. Again, consequently, the whole order with all its authority is comprised in the general. The general is so powerful that he may t that he make sorry. The general is so powerful that he may make and alter special constitutions for the society abrogate them and make new ones, even giving these documents any date he pleases. The constitutions further provide that all such new rules must be regarded as confirmed by the popes from the time they are dated. Such is the power of the quote-unquote black pope. 
Our Father General, said the Spanish Jesuit F. Dosa in 1667, quote, as all know, governs Rome itself and the Popedom too. We make war at our pleasure, unquote. This is proof, if any is needed, that the glorified figurehead Pope, like the faithful servant of Don Quixote, Rocinante, can never stir too far from his master's side. Now, this is a sentence that maybe some people do not understand, but you have to understand that this story that was written hundreds of years ago of Don Quixote, this sad knight who was on his horse fighting against windmills, is actually an allegory of the Black Pope. And the horse that Don Quixote that night rode on, yeah, it is explained here in a little footnote, and that will make it more easy for you to understand this. I'm going to read the footnote, and then I'm going to read the sentence again. The footnote explains to us that the last part of the name of Quixote's horse, Rocinante, or Rosinante, Ante, is Ante. That's the last name of Don Quixote's horse. Ante meaning in front of, A-N-T-E. Yeah? Thus, the figurehead Pope is said to lead from the front, while the Jesuit general pulls the strings behind the scenes. Now the sentence again. This is proof, the quote from Jesuit Doza in 1667, if any is needed anyway, that the glorified figurehead Pope, like the faithful servant of Don Quixote, the horse, Rocinante, can never stir too far from his master's side. Indeed, P.D. Stewart continues, quote, the shrewd Roman or Italian populace have long shown their recognition of this fact by styling these two great personages severally, the White Pope and the Black Pope. Unquote. Abbe Fremont, or Abbot Fremont, also was of the view that, quote, the Jesuits, in the person of their general, uh, again, you have this um, expression that the whole society is comprised in one person, the Jesuits, in the person of their general, dominate the Vatican. On the next page comes a very interesting sentence, Brett. Mm. Alexander Robertson puts it thus, quote, The general of the Jesuits, the black pope, is the real and only pope. The general of the Jesuits, the black pope, is the real and only pope. The white pope is only a puppet on the strings. The one who bears the title is but a figurehead. It is the Jesuits' policy he pursues, their voice that speaks through him, their hand that guides him. When illustrating this fact to me, Count Campello, who was a great friend of the late Pope Pio Nono, Pius IX, drew a circle and said, quote, within that circle he, the white Pope, is free. If he crosses it, he is a dead man, unquote. Now, why is this quote so important? And mm. you will probably laugh when you read this here, because this is one of the advertising sentences used by Luxi Verbi, the publishing company of P.D. Stewart's books, for making advertisement for his third book, Pope Francis, Lord of the World, which we are waiting for one and a half year to finally get it. Mm -hmm. And there also is that quote on that site. You can read that for yourself on the website of Luxi Verbi. Within that circle, the Pope is free. If he crosses it, he is a dead man. Any comments? Up to here, Brad. Oh, I'm just listening in. It's uh, really... Uh... Very profound, Jörg. Keep going. And the respected Jesuit Jean-Pierre Gury, who was professor of moral theology at the Collège Romain, the Jesuits' college in Rome, which is the Collegium Romanum, adds, 
quote, in truth, the society, means the Jesuits, has never from the very first obeyed the white Pope whenever its will and his happen to run counter to each other, unquote. So this means that from the moment of the ordination by Antichrist Pope Paul III of Ignatius Loyola and his Compagnie de Jesus on, the white Pope only was, as they are, we have quoted already earlier in this book, a stick in the hands of an old man. He has been a puppet that has been controlled by the general of the Society of Jesus from the beginnings. And another author says, P.D. Stewart continues, quote, the Pope must obey the Jesuit cardinals who, though they kiss his foot, tie his hands. A great tertius weapon in the Pope's hand. Although highly educated and intelligent, nay, erudite, yet the Jesuits must take an oath, quote, to have no mind of their own, unquote, to call black white if the Pope, the black Pope, their general, says so, or if it be in the church's interest so to do. Each and every member of the Order of Loyola was to be in the hands of his superior, quote, as the axe is in the hands of the woodcutter, unquote, and, quote, as a staff is in the hands of an old man, which serves him wherever and in whatever thing he is pleased to use it, unquote. Or, as McCullough puts it, quote, a great, -ish, a great tuitous weapon to be placed in the Pope's hand, unquote, the black Pope. That is, when we speak about the Pope, here we mean the Black Pope. Every Jesuit, wrote English poet Robert Southey, is like a suit of clothes, an empty mantle, with another man on the inside, the person and the will of the general, that is. You get it? Every Jesuit is like a suit of clothes with another man inside, and that man inside is the will of the general of the society. To quote Southey's elegant satire, quote, A Jesuit may be shortly described as an empty suit of clothes for a man or a mantle with another person living in them, who acts for him, thinks for him, decides for him, whether he shall be a prince or a beggar, and moves him about wheresoever he pleases, who allows him to exhibit the internal aspects, uh, the eternal aspect of a man, but leaves him none of the privileges. No liberty, no property, no affections, not even the power to refuse obedience when ordered to commit the most atrocious of crimes. For the more he outrages his own feelings, the greater his merits. Unquote. Obedience to the superior is his only idea of virtue, and in all other respects, he is a mere image. Here is the end of the quote. The Jesuit must render absolute and unquestioning obedience to the general, without reserve, if he says peace the Jesuit must say peace. If he says war, the Jesuit must say war. Whatever the general says or commands, the Jesuit must say ditto. Rule one of the spiritual exercises of Loyola states, with all judgment laid aside, we ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey our holy mother, the church hierarchical. And spiritual exercise rule 13 instructs the Jesuit to agree as follows, quote, I will believe that the white that I see is black if the hierarchical church so defines it, unquote. Mm -hmm. Further, when a Jesuit takes his fourth or peculiar vow, you know, the oath that we were speaking about earlier in another broadcast, mm -hmm. he binds himself to go without question, delay or repugnance 
to whatever region of the earth and on whatever errand the Pope may be pleased to send him. And the Pope, understand, here is of course the Black Pope. This he promises to the omnipotent God and to his general, holding for him the place of God. The wisdom, justice and righteousness of the command he is not to question. He is not even to permit his mind to dwell upon it for a moment. It is the command of his general, and the command of the general is the precept of the Almighty. His superiors are over him in the place of the divine majesty. When the command of the superior goes forth, the person to whom it is directed is not to stay till he has finished the letter his pen is tracing says the constitutions, he must give instant compliance so that holy obedience may be perfect in us in every point in execution, in will, in intellect. Indeed, obedience in Jesuitism is styled the tomb of the will or the death of the will. That's what the spiritual exercises are all about. Mm. To kill your own will. Mm -hmm. You bring your own will to the grave. Obedience in Jesuitism is styled the tomb of the will or the death of the will. It is said that it is, quote, a blessed blindness which causes the soul to see the road to salvation, unquote. Therefore, the members of the Society of Jesus are taught to, quote, emulate their will as a sheep is sacrificed, unquote. They are told that they are to be in the hands of their superiors as the axe is in the hands of the woodcutter or as the staff is in the hands of an old man which serves him wherever and in whatever thing he is pleased to use it. On this point, James Edkin Wiley comments most eloquently, quote, the annals of mankind do not furnish another example of a despotism so finished, unquote. By the way, taken from History of Protestantism, Volume 2, Book 15, which we are going to read in the future, I assume. Mm -hmm. To put it even more crisply, the Constitutions enjoin that, quote, they who live under obedience shall permit themselves to be moved and directed under divine providence by their superiors, just as if they were a corpse. Perinde ac cadaver, well disciplined like a corpse, says Loyola, which allows itself to be moved and handled in any way. In any way? Yes, in any way. This obligation to obey Perinde ac F. Cadaver requires every Jesuit to be not just a corpse, but a puppet. Copia faciunt, haut minus ac isu faciunt. They must do just as they are ordered, you know, from the beginning of Wow, Israel. fascient is ordered? Is that what that means, fascient? Well, I have to type this into the translator to see which word means watch, but, but altogether <laughs> it means copia fasciunt, haut minus ac isui fasciunt. I can't so help but uh, they must... comment that it's so close to fasci. <laughs> yeah, th th that's right, but fasci is with an S, right? Yes, uh, yes, that's correct. Yes. So they must do just as they are ordered, as we said already in the beginning mm. of this reading. Mm. As in 1709, when they had almost the entire community of nuns of Port Royal excommunicated, some of the nuns were imprisoned while others were dispersed off to different convents for refusing to submit to the bull Viniam Domini Sabaos. The convent was later leveled to the ground. I will not dwell on the details, nor the violence perpetrated against the defenseless nuns. It is enough to record here that an order that an order in council at Rome was obtained for the removal of every sister from the convent, together with the destruction of Port Royal under the auspices of Antichrist Pope Clement XI. On January 22nd, 1709, the Jesuits had the whole edifice demolished, completely. But even that did not satisfy the revengeful Jesuits. In 1711, two years later, the bodies and the convent cemetery, the burial ground for the nuns for 500 years, 
were disinterred, dug up with the grossest circumstance and indecency. All the corpses, or what remained of them, were thrown into a single pit, dug for that very purpose in the cemetery of St. Lambert. But even more diabolical was the fact that the pit was then left open, allowing the bodies and bones to be eaten by dogs. What savagery, what rabidness, what evil venom of serpents! Surely we are justified in saying of these Jesuits, de malus pessimus genere monarchy, that is to say, the very worst kind of monks. Starting the next part of this chapter, called the Jesuit monarchy, today. Today, dear listener. The Jesuit monarchy covers the globe, and at its head is a sovereign general. The Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, so complicated and yet so harmoniously controlled by a single hand. Under the constitutions, one man, the general, is given power as an absolute monarch over the whole Society of Jesus, distributed throughout all regions of the world and over all the individual members of the same. The regular Jesuit sources, writes Manfred Barthel, always blandly insists that the general concerned himself entirely with spiritual and administrative matters. But this could not be further from the case. In Rome, where he resides, the general has a council of five assistants, who hold office until the death of the general, one each for Italy, France, Spain and the countries of Spanish origin, one for Germany, Austria, Poland, Belgium, Hungary, Holland, and one for English-speaking countries, England, Ireland, United States, Canada, and British colonies, except India. Dalla writes, quote, The Jesuit monarchy covers the globe. At its head, as we have said, is a sovereign who rules over all, but is himself ruled over by no one. First come six grand divisions, termed assistanzen, or in English, assistancies. Assistanzen is the German word for that. Satrapies or kingdoms, or uh, princedoms, sorry. These comprehend the space stretching from the Indus to the Mediterranean, more particularly India, Spain, and Portugal, Germany and France, Italy and Sicily, Poland and Lithuania. Outside this area, the Jesuits have established missions. The assistances and provinces are headed by assistants and provincials. And just a little note on the side. Jorge Mario Borgoglio, the present Pope Francis, was the provincial of South America, mm -hmm. ruling from out Argentina. Now it gets really juicy. Mm -hmm. The Society of Jesus and the Holy Office. As we read much earlier, the original bull of Antichrist Pope Paul III, constituting the Society of Jesus, gave to Ignatius de Loyola and his companions the power to make constitutions and particular rules and also to alter them. This legislative power rests in the hand of the general and his office or, per, or prefect that is in a congregation representing them. This congregation was once called the Holy Office of the Inquisition, a.k.a. also known as the Sacred Roman Congregation and Universal Inquisition. Today it is called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The office or department under which all modern members of the Society of Jesus continue to take their orders is the set revamped Sacred Roman Congregation and Universal Inquisition, a title that for centuries had provoked universal revulsion and disgust. It is important to remember that the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith 
was born in 1542 under the name Sacred Congregation of the Universal Inquisition, and that this same congregation for the doctrine of the faith was, until 2005, directed by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger for 25 years before he assumed the title of Pope Benedict XVI. Now, I just want to make a very short remark here. Do not try to teach me that Pope Francis is the first Jesuit pope. <laughs> I Thank do not you, believe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How I do could not we believe ever know? That... How could we ever know? <laughs> they're probably all Jesuits. I mean, they're trained Jesuit. Come on. I, I do not believe that for a split second that yeah. Francis is the first Jesuit pope. Yeah. The more you study especially, this, man. Yeah. Especially when we read here about Cardinal Ratzinger, who was 25 years the head of the um, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which is the modern Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And we know, according to Tepa Saucy, that two years after the ordination of the Jesuit order, the Jesuits took over from the Dominicans the Inquisition. Even I, I, I don't even say that Ratzinger was a Jesuit, but he was Jesuit trained. And we will read that in the coming page that is coming up here, because I read that already. We are going to read some so baffling stuff. Mm -hmm. You really have Please, to yeah. wash your ears now to make sure that you really <laughs> get it all in. Pause the tape. Wash up. Go <laughs> Take smoke a, a break. cigarette, drink a coffee, and then come back. But don't miss what's coming right now. Yeah, Don't miss what's coming right now. The history of the congregation is shortly as follows. It was established on July 21st, 1542 by Antichrist Pope Paul III under the constitution lead set up Initio, which also established a, the Universal Inquisition. So, 1542, what I just tell you, to, told you, in Rulers of Evil, Tapa Saucy writes that after two years of negotiations, the Jesuit took over from the Dominican order the, in, the, 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 in, uh, the Inquisition. 1540, 1542, two years, exactly as P.D. Stewart says here, okay, which was uh, which also established the Universal Inquisition. In 1908, the word Inquisition was dropped from the title, and it took the name, the, quote, Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office, a.k.a. the Holy Office. So, whether you say Sacred Congregation of the Holy Office or just Holy Office, means the same. Realizing the need to distance itself from its past atrocities. It underwent another facelift in 1965, mm. the year of Vatican II, during the papacy of Antichrist Pope Paul VI. Hitherto, it was known not as the Holy Office, but under the new title of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or Congregatio Pro. Doctrina Fidei. For over two decades, until 2005, that congregation was headed by the Bavarian-born Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. It may surprise you, dear reader, but the present Pope was once called the Great Inquisitor and the pit bull of the Inquisition by the Jesuits. Mr. Dostoevsky, I'm sure, will agree. In fact, Ratzinger is a Jesuit-picked cardinal from Bavaria, Germany. We present proof of this assertion below. Prior to becoming Pope, Ratzinger was appointed professor of the highly prestigious theology department at the University of Tübingen in Germany on the strong recommendation and now hold fast, of the Jesuit Hans Küng, who at the time was dean of the department. Now, why did I say hold fast? Brett, doesn't that ring a bell in your head? Hans <laughs> Küng, that name, didn't you send me the book Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge some no, no, time no. ago? No, no, that wasn't me. <laughs> Brother, oh, that wasn't you. That was someone else, and you sent me a copy, brother. 
<laughs> oh, it wasn't that way. Okay, I sent yeah. you a copy. <laughs> yes, you did, and thank you very much. I bumped into it the other day, and I was thinking, man, I got to take a look at that sometime. Yeah, we really have to take a look yes, at that because this book, yes, yes, this book, you. Fundamentalism yes. as an Ecumenical Challenge, oh, is edited by boy. Hans Küng. Talk about sending your mind into a, a feedback loop on this one, Yerk. Yike. Scary thoughts here. But That's maybe that that I stumbled about reality. the book and the book and I gave it to you. I, you. I don't remember yes. that anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No but problem. I, no problem. You know, yesterday evening I was reading also this page and I mm. saw Hans Küng and mm. I sat in the living. My mother had run the television, mm. so I wasn't hundred percent mm. concentrated on what I was reading. <laughs> you I almost said, fell Kung, out of your chair. <laughs> I said, Hans Küng, I know that name, I know that name. I jumped from my chair, I went into my bedroom, I opened the closet, I went through my books, and I said, here, yes. I got it. Yes. Edited by Hans Küng, Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge. I got the book here. This Hans Küng was strongly, um, as it says here, um, recommended uh, he recommended the theology department of the University of Tübingen. Mm -hmm. This Hans Küng was at the time that Cardinal Ratzinger studied there, dean of the department. So this Hans Küng Jesuit is not an unimportant person, I can assure you. And that makes me even more wanting to look into this book consisting of yeah, some hundred pages, oh, of wow. course, uh, and reading about fundamentalism as an ecumenical challenge. Uh, you know, Yerk, I just about lost it when I... <laughs> I bought this old encyclopedia, I, I suppose. You know about that, Yerk, and maybe some of the listeners know, but, um, you know, I'm really into collecting books right now. And... Uh, these old encyclopedias come up cheap here in Minnesota from time to time. And I just happen to get in the rhythm of checking every summer, Yerk, on mm -hmm. Craigslist, which is a free site to list things. And, mm -hmm. you know, when people move from a house into an apartment, for example, they don't want to take all their books with them, especially if they're old books and they can find them online. They'd rather not have them. So like these uh, old hard copies of the Britannica, they don't want them anymore. Mm. And they're just a hindrance. So once in a while, I'll see one on there and uh, I'll, uh, I'll think, well, I wonder if I could use that. Well, I just happened, just so happens that uh, a ninth edition came up for a hundred bucks. Now, it wasn't listed that way. He just had it listed for sale. And I told him I'm interested. And uh, I negotiated with him, and he gave it to me for 100 bucks, Some 25 volumes or 30 volumes, I forget what it is. But wow. I looked up theology in there. And, you know, we ought to do, I ought to do a scan of that and send that to you, Yerk, and we should look at that too. Because, uh, well, simply, you know, Yerk and I both know it, Theology is a creation of the Greece, Grecian uh, Empire, I suppose. Uh, how yeah. would you say that? Yeah, of the Greek Empire. Yeah. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. Theology, the study of God, comes mm -hmm. out of the philosophy and psychology school. Mm -hmm. Philosophy, most and for all. Mm -hmm. You know? And especially together with psychology, that is why you have then later theosophy. Ooh. Which is the combination of psychology and theology. Oh, yike. That's a really good point, Yerk. I mean, this stuff is really simple once you break it down and you've studied it. But if you've never looked at it and thought about it enough, you're going to get hit with this in the face. It's like having ice slammed in your face. It hurts mm. like freaking hell. Yeah. And people don't like it, man. They really don't like it, you know. So, ah, I'll stop ranting. But, yeah, I had to deal with that yesterday. My best friend here in Minneapolis, uh, I called him up because I haven't talked to him in a long time. And just to let you know real brief that uh, he uh, he's, um, you know, having to deal with the life in the city there. It's a lot different than where I live out here away from the city. 
um, there's some real uh, benefits to being out of the city, and one of them is is uh, being away from all of the indoctrination that's going on in there. It's bad. That's for sure. It yeah. really stinks, Yerk. There is no way that I would ever be able to do this with you if I wasn't living out of that place. There just isn't. Not that I know of, not that I'm aware of. I just, I have a hard time dealing with that city, man. It is just, ugh, yuck. Okay, back to the book reading here. But Good. you know, could you, the interesting, mm, yeah. Could you please back up when you do start reading again to the that prior to becoming Pope? Because I think this is just super important to get this through about this Hans Kung. But please continue. You were going to make Yeah, it is, it is surely interesting. And I, if, before I go, I, I, I back up a little bit. I just want to go yeah. and, and read and, and go and uh, read to you the content oh. of the book. Fundamentalism as an ecumenical oh, challenge yeah, that was yeah, edited you by Hans that King. To me here. Thank you. So when you when you open it up and you look at the content, what is this book all about? We see definition. What is fundamentalism? Theological perspectives. What is fundamentalism today? Perspectives in social psychology. Fundamentalism, dogmatism, fanaticism, psychiatric perspectives. Global fundamental fundamentalism sociological perspectives part two jewish fundamentalism what is the challenge of contemporary jewish fundamentalism and what shall be the answer to contemporary jewish fundamentalism from the point of view of course of jesuit hans Kuhn. part three islamic or islamic fundamentalism what is the challenge of contemporary Islamic fundamentalism? What shall be the answer of, to contemporary Islamic fundamentalism? Four, Christian fundamentalism, the challenge of orthodox traditionalism, fundamentalist pope, the challenge of Protestant fundamentalism, well, they only spent 10 pages on that, then comes a synthesis, fundamentalism and modernity, and of course, again, in the end, against contemporary Roman Catholic fundamentalism. And that is the book Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge all about, that was published in 1992, <clears throat> uh, first published in 1992, and I have a reissue printing here of 1996. It's an English translation, so I will maybe read that on my channel in the future, I don't know. The problem is I wanted to get that book in German, because Originally, it had been written in German. Hans Küng is a German. Jürgen Moltmann, the other editor, is a German. But I could not, for the love of God, find this book in German. Mm -hmm. So if anybody can ever provide me with Hans Küng and Jürgen Moltmann editing the book Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge in German, I would be very grateful. And this is just because, you know, mm -hmm. I do yeah. research almost every day. Mm -hmm. And in one of the days of the research, I fell about this title, Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge by Hans Küng. I got that book, I sent it to Brett, and now I read Code Word Babylon, and what does it say? All of a sudden, on page 127, I read about Paul Bratzinger and the connection with Hans Küng. Prior to becoming Pope, P.D. Stewart says in this book, Ratzinger was appointed professor of the highly prestigious theology department at the University of Tübingen in Germany on the strong recommendation of the Jesuit Hans Küng, who at the time was dean of the department. Interestingly, as we shall see later, Bavaria was home to the Jesuit founder of the revolutionary order called the Illuminati, Adam Weishaupt. And you know from all my videos before that Bavaria always has been the Catholic stronghold in Germany. Yeah, whenever I is, think of that 4th of July, Yerk, I'm sorry. I yeah. always think of May 1st, and I think, what yeah. a horrible thing. You're going to celebrate this crap? <laughs> Oh, how worthless. It just makes, you know, my mom came to visit the other day and she says, oh, we're going to have 4th of July at my house. I'll just have to go and just have, you know, I have to be so, 
I don't know. You know, when is it that people are going to make a connection with this? You know, if they keep waiting, they're going to just be so shocked that they won't be able to move. It's like a deer in the headlights. Brett, people are just not interested in these things. They're not. It's they a just shame. Wanna have, they it's just want to have. They just want to have their bread and games. They yeah, want to have something bread to and eat. Circus. They Damn right, have their, that's what it's all about, the games. They want to have their sick. entertainment. They want to have their world. video games, their movies, oh, sick their world. television series. Tell they want to have their social media. They want to have as many quote-unquote friends as possible on Facebook and Twitter and all these social media. They want to drink their beer. They want to smoke their joint. They want to fornicate with women, with men. They don't care about things that we are doing and reading here. They don't no, care about right. the real life. That's right. You know? Well, you know, if anything brings indignation, it's remembering all that old crap that we used to do. Yeah. It's junk. It's trash. It belongs in the garbage bin and rotting in the grave. I could care less for it too. All right, you're, let me please. let me just repeat this last sentence because it's really getting please into do. something interesting. Interestingly, P.D. Stewart says, as we shall see later, because we are only on page one twenty-seven, mm. so we still got a few pages to cover in this book. Bavaria was home to the Jesuit founder of the revolutionary order called the Illuminati, and it is therefore not surprising that Bavaria would later become the beating heart of Hitler's Nazi revolution. And if you want to understand this a little bit more, you have to turn to my English reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits, where I explain to you in detail that it was the plan of the papacy, and by that the Jesuits, long ago, to overthrow Protestant Prussia, rule in Germany with the Catholic rule that comes out from the South. By that, they had to combine Austria and Bavaria, Austria and Germany together, and they did that with the Anschluss in 1938. Did you want to say something there, Brad? The Anschluss? No, I'm learning, man. It's This is quite a bit to take in. Yeah, the Anschluss, that is the, the collection of Austria. Back, uh, in Germany, they say Heim ins Reich holen, uh, to get it back into the empire, to get Austria back into the empire, because Austria was split away from Germany after oh. the Napoleonic Wars, because in the in the First Reich, the Thousand-Year Reich, the quote-unquote um, holy, uh, yes. uh, holy uh, you, Roman you, yes. Reich of of German nation mm, between mm -hmm. 800 and the 1800s, mm -hmm. Austria was part of that. Mm -hmm. Austria, Germany was the Holy Roman Empire. Do, uh, do I remember this right? Was it 1871? No, that was uh, 1871 was the founding of the Second German Reich. The, the Second Protestant Reich. Reich okay, by, got it. The Protestant yeah. Reich by, uh, by, by, um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, by Bismarck. Yes. But at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, in the beginning of the 1800s, of the, of the 19th century, um, the old German Empire that started with Charlemagne in about 800 and ruled for a thousand years mm. broke up. And then Austria split from Germany and the Habsburgs take, took over there. Mm -hmm. That Habsburg That's line it. that was it. in there. Yep. And, and, uh, and then there was a war between the north and the south of Germany uh, with the Deutsche, uh, with the Nordbund and the Deutsche Bund, and um, that war was in 1866. That led to the unification of Germany. Then France wanted to attack Germany because they didn't agree with that, and Germany defeated France in the war of 1870-1871. And then Bismarck founded the Second Reich, which was the Protestant German Reich between 1871 and 1918, the end of World War One. Then we had for some 20 years, or for some 15 years, actually, until 1933, this puppet government of the Weimarer Democratic Republic. And then Hitler came to power in 1933. And when he came to power, he was an Austrian coming out of Bavaria and then claiming Berlin 
and by that fulfilling the wishes of the Jesuits that the Protestant Prussian power from Berlin that had ruled over Germany was demolished and taken over by the Nazi Catholic government of Adolf Hitler in Berlin at that time. But therefore, you have to turn to my readings of the secret history of the Jesuits. And I don't know if that is up already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because right. I don't know when this one will be published. And I haven't right. published even one reading of the, uh, the secret history of the Jesuits. Uh, and I have done already up to now, I think, 23 readings or, or something like that. Wow. And I still have to continue for 40 pages. Wow. So I'm not done yet. Uh, but I don't know when that will come out. But if it ha if it had come out because Brett wants to publish that for before me, uh, then turn to Brett's YouTube channel and check out the secret history of the Jesuits if that is already published there, and you will get a deeper insight into that little reading that we are doing right here, right now on this case. Um, yep, that's right. Brett, Mm -hmm. Do you want to make a little artificial break for a few seconds, uh, and then you can decide whether you can take a second um, uh, a second recording after this, and then we're going to stop here for a moment? Sure. That'd be fine, Jörg. Um, You know, I had uh, made a commitment to uh, talk with someone here at 1030, so if you wanted, we could just keep going till 1030. Okay, we do that. Let's okay. do that, please. Okay. But okay, if you want to take a little ba uh, bathroom break or something, we could do no, that. No, no, that's okay. okay. That's okay. okay. Then we're no, going to I don't need to go. I'm fine. It's, it's, it's just another 35 minutes, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Let's keep going. Okay. So let's go about 30 minutes and then we'll have together. This broadcast will then be an hour and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. fine. That's we are fine. stretching the attention span of the listeners and viewers of this video anyway. Yes, we are. Anyway, this was just information that I wanted to give to you if you want to learn more about that Catholic takeover of Germany. Um, you have to go to my reading I did on the secret history of Jesuits, a book by Edmond Paris that was published in 1975. So P.D. Stewart says here, I'm going to repeat this last sentence, and it is therefore not surprising that Bavaria would later become the beating heart of Hitler's Nazi revolution. Antichrist Pope Benedict XVI, which is the new name for Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, is intensively Bavarian and was educated at colleges in Bavaria, most of which were founded and controlled by the Jesuits. In 1252, the then Pope made a decree stipulating the exact details of how the prisoners of the Inquisition were to be tortured, including children from the age of 12 and upwards. More than 50 million members of the human family, I don't agree with this term, but I'm just going to read it as it is said here, more than 50 million members of the quote-unquote human family is estimated to have been slaughtered under the sanction of the Catholic Church, as we can read in John Dowling's work, History of Rome. I do not agree with 50 million. There are numbers as far as 500 million and oh, even beyond. Yes. But oh, it is not yes. about accounting here. The oh, real counting so will be done people. in heaven, and Think Jesus Christ will... Them. Jesus yeah. Christ will make that known to all of us when we are with him and we will all see the atrocities that have been done by Satan in this fleshly world. And on the Inquisition, just another side note from me, excuse me to make advertisement for quote-unquote <laughs> my work. I read on my second channel a book uh, from, uh, I don't even know the, the author anymore because it's so long ago that I have started uh, that I have done another part. I have to really go back and read that book further. But it is about the history of the Inquisition. It is a book from the 17th, uh, from, yeah, from the 17th century, and um, very, very interesting. I have uploaded 30 parts up to today, uh, the 13th of uh, of February 2018, on my second channel, and you can find that there. I have four more parts waiting on my computer to be published. And I will read the book out completely. And in Germany, uh, in German, not in Germany, but mm -hmm. in German, I have started reading from Henry Charles Lear, History of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, which is three volumes, about 2,000 pages. And I have done 11 videos so far. 
and that is in Germany, I will read the complete, complete three volumes also, just to let you know that on my channel you can find a lot on the Inquisition, as well in English as in German. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, Philip van Limborch was the author of the English-speaking book. Uh, he wrote that book originally in Latin, and it was uh, in 1692. Oh, Jörg, I really like those. Uh, there are some really good points in that book, no doubt. And I haven't even I haven't even started into the nitty gritty. I'm, I'm sure, just... but still, the in intro part was important too. There, yeah, you there know, are some the, really the first, good points in there. The first two to three hundred pages are just introduction. Yeah. That's right. It's a book of, all, uh, of, of about 800 pages. So yes. I haven't even started to get into the nitty gritty yes, of that. That's book. right. That's, well, you got to lay, lay the groundwork. It takes time. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, and uh, I will continue. I will read that. Looking book. forward I, I to that, Yerk. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm one of your listeners looking forward to that. <laughs> Just so you know. Love it. Oh, I know it has. It going, I know it has brother. listeners, but uh, right, you know, excellent. it's it's just it's just you know you read about the Inquisition and you have no imagination what it is all about, and yeah, when you read right. book like the history of the Inquisition from Philip van Limborg, which was then translated by Samuel Chandler in 1731 into English, or you read from Henry Charles Lear the history of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages, it all comes alive. It or does. when you have time yeah, and does. you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, for example, all of a sudden you can imagine more about that because so you just read about the world and you say, oh yeah, Inquisition. Oh yeah, so many years ago, 50 million people died. So what? But when you get into that, it lets you get your hair stand up in the back of your neck. Yeah, it sends you sense. shivers down your spine. It sends you tears down your eyes, down your face when you are reading this. Sometimes when I read these things, I have to stop recording. I just have to pass. I'm yep. pause. I'm 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 crying. Yep. And I'm not a soft guy, you know. Yep. I know. But when you are really made um aware known with yeah. all these atrocities, oh, aware yeah. of all the things that happened over there, you cannot but shed a take few a tears, moment. yeah. Shed a few I, tears I did last night on the way home from that book, uh, and just just uh, thinking about um, you know what they've hid from us, Yerk, um, mm. intentionally or not intentionally. Just uh, you know, um, I mean, I think maybe that book uh, by James Aiken Wiley was published after his death. I'm not even sure, but I thought I, I remember seeing uh, James Aiken Wiley. Don't quote me on this, but. To living to 1890, and this one was published in 1892. So I don't know. I'm just saying. I actually do not know his time of birth and time of death. I yeah, have to I was just uh, looking the other day. I thought I saw that, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. So don't take this. Take it with a grain of salt, well, please. It's, it's very well possible, Brett, uh, that that was published post mortem. Mm -hmm. And that that is one of the reasons that you cannot get it today anymore. Exactly. Very good point. It must have been so scarce, even at the time of his death or after yeah, his death. At the I, time don't of death. Yeah. I don't know. Didn't, I it, mean, didn't it say? Didn't it say in that movie that you made yesterday that it was a print of just two thousand editions? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The book? Yeah, it did. I mean, just 2,000 two, copies. It what said 2,000 there. It said 2,000. So that probably means you're right. Uh, I think Tom would know if we could ask him about it. Um, he, yeah, he would know too. Um, I think it's about that. It means about 2,000 copies, at least in that edition. Yeah, at that time. I think you're right. I think you're right. Now, even think about it. 2,000 at that time maybe was many, especially for a book like that. But even if you multiply that with five or with six, what is 10 of 12,000 editions of that book? To survive 120 years. Oh my! It's just it it baffles me that I was even even able to find it here in Minneapolis. Yeah, mind boggling, huh? How oh, sometimes you can stumble about. mind boggling gives me goosebumps thinking about it. How you can stumble about those things right before your front door, right? Yes. So please, your continue. Absolutely. Yeah, but I'm gonna retreat to the beginning of Please the last do. paragraph on page 127. In 1252, the then Pope made a decree stipulating the exact details of how the prisoners of the Inquisition were to be tortured. 
just look at a few of the torture pictures that I put up in the Inquisition song, you know, that I use in the beginning of mm -hmm. my Hour of the Truth broadcasts, mm -hmm. including children from the age of 12 and upwards. Yeah, 12 was the age for girls and 14 was the age of men or young men from what on they could have been tortured, I read somewhere else. Mm -hmm. More than at least, let's say, 50 million members of the human family, quote unquote, just of from mankind, Spain, just of from man. Spain, right? No, not just Spanish from Spain. Inquisition? No, that's not that's not just from Spain. I'm I'm quite sure this is uh, about all the Inquisition oh. that ran all through Europe, including the killing of the Albigenses, Waldenses, the Huguenots, the no, no Bartholomew the Massacre, stuff. and all that stuff. I think we'll that is all included in there. To put it put it in that category, it's just way beyond our comprehension. That much death. I mean, come on. Yeah, and it's probably it's... much more than just quote unquote fifty million. Yeah, exactly. It's enough said. <clears throat> Anyway, more than 50 million members of the quote-unquote human family is estimated to have been slaughtered under the sanction of the Catholic Church, according to John Dowling in History of Rome, Book 8. For nearly six centuries, writes Peter de Rosa, in The Dark Side of the Papacy, his book, you know, um, mm -hmm. that is one of the books that is on my list to read, too, mm -hmm. in the future, not one, not one of the 80 popes from the 13th to the 19th century, you know, the 605 years between 1203 and 1805 of the quote-unquote official of Inquisition, said a word against the diabolical machinery of the Inquisition. Rather, they each added their own cruel touch to the awful machinery of death. You know, Brett, I disagree with you that it is only the Spanish Inquisition because we are speaking about the time between 1203 and 1805. As we can mm. read here in 1255, the then Pope made a decree stipulating the exact details of the prisoners of the Inquisition, how they were to be tortured. That cannot only mean Spain because the Spanish Inquisition, all uh, most and for all, took part under uh, Philip II and this... Uh, uh, Queen Isabella. I'm sorry. Right? You're, I, I'm was, sorry. I I uh, I was uh, just. Um, I guess I heard Tom say that to you. So um, forgive me for parroting quote unquote what Tom said, but I I don't really know. I mean, this is what's so interesting about about what you're doing, Yurk, is because you're giving us a European perspective. I have no idea. I don't. I mean, in terms of studying this, come on, it takes a long time. The Inquisition was uh, apparent in all countries of Europe at that time. Yeah. And not only in Spain. The Spanish Inquisition, who killed millions and millions of people alone in Spain, is the Inquisition that started at the end of the 15th century under Queen Isabella and King Philip. Man. You yeah. know? That's right. That at the is time the Spanish of Ignatius Inquisition. Loyola. Yeah. That, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the end of the 15th century, that That's is the right. Spanish Inquisition. That's but right. we have the Inquisition all over Europe, throughout the quote unquote Holy Roman Empire of German nation, of course, in that time, because that's what I'm reading in in in, in the history of the Inquisition in the Middle Ages of Henry Charles Lear. Mm -hmm. I'm reading of history even before the 1200s in there. You know. Yes. It's it's very very interesting. If you want to get your hands on that book, I can tell you. Um, this book from Henry Charles Lear, written at the end of the 19th century, um, in three volumes. I got all three volumes for 20 bucks. I got all three volumes too, Yerk, for 60 bucks. Yep. Yeah, but got you them got right them my in hands. English. I got them in German. Yep. yep. Yeah, That's I right. don't have the English ones, you know. Yep. I got but, them right uh, in my I'm, hand right now. Yeah, I'm going to read the German. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, at the one here. <laughs> it's on my oh, printer wow. lying there next to the Bible. Okay, good. 
and under the book of David W. Daniels did the Catholic Church give us the Bible. Uh, all the books that I have here, Fundamentalism as an Ecumenical Challenge. I have also here the Catholics and uh, German Humanity between 1866 and 1871. And I have the book here, The City of Seven Hills by Henry Grattan Gillis. Mm. So I got a lot of books surrounding me here. But anyway, that's <laughs> not the point, And uh, let's not divert too far from the subject because we only have about 20 minutes to go. But the point that I want to make is when we are reading here about the quote-unquote Inquisition and you have no imagination what that all about, well, don't use spiritual exercises, get books and read it for yourself, okay? And you will educate yourself in this very, very important subject. Not one of the 80 popes from the 13th to the 19th century said a word against the diabolical machinery of the Inquisition. Rather, they each added their own cruel touch to the awful machinery of death. And again, it says here the Inquisition start, uh, ended in the 19th century, which is the beginning of the 1800s, with the end of the Napoleonic Wars, you know, when Napoleon went into Spain and he discovered the atrocities, the secret tunnels between the monasteries of a nun and the and the uh, and, and the convent uh, the convent of a nunnery and the monastery of monks and the secret tunnels and all the um, buried babies there, thousands of babies that have been buried there, that have been suffocated in the first minutes of their life because the monks wanted to fornicate with the nuns and did that so for years and years. When Napoleon went into there, and this is documented fact, you can look that up everywhere, that is so-called the end of the Inquisition. Mm. It is not the Inquisition in Spain was active until the 1970s, until the death of fascist leader Francisco Franco, who died in 1976, if I'm not mistaken. I remember that I don't know why. I was wow. 10 years old. I was on my way to school in the morning. I listened to the radio during my breakfast before I went to school. I was 10 years old, and I don't know up to this day why this radio message always had a place in my brain, in my memory. When they said, the Spanish dictator Francisco Franco just died. I didn't know who he was at that time. <laughs> I was 10 years old for crying mm. out loud. Right, what did right. I know? Mm -hmm. But that the memory that I got that message on the radio that day never, ever left my mind. Stranger. Huh? No, no, and not strange. It's just, just when, the way it works. Just when he died, until the beginning of the 1970s, the Inquisition was alive and well in Spain, even using all these different torture apparatus that they used all through the ages. They were still in use until today, 2018, let's say some even 50 years ago. That is how, quote-unquote, modern we are. That is, quote-unquote, how civilized we are. Mm -hmm. Don't make me puke. Mm -hmm. If the objection be raised that Catholics, too, have been killed by Rome, <laughs> then we say, sure, for Rome will wade through the blood of Roman Catholics to get to the heretics. Never forget this fact. They sacrifice and kill their own if that leads them to their enemy they eventually want to reach. And again, I can just turn you to my reading. The parts about 19, 20, 21, 22, 23 of the secret history of the Jesuits when I deal with the NDH, the uh, independent state of Croatia that was broken out of Yugoslavia during the Second World War and that genocide that took place there. Of course, there and in Germany, in Nazi Germany in the Third Reich also, they killed quote-unquote liberal Catholics because liberal Catholics are not holding on to the Trentine dogma. And what is Trentine dogma? Well, that what has been decided at the Council of Trent between 1545 and 1563. That council stands today as it stood 500 years ago. And when you are a Catholic that does not 
keep the extreme dogma of the Council of Trent, you are a liberal. And by that, you can be dispersed of because you are not ultramontane. Mm-hmm. Did you mean tridentine, Eric? Tridentine? No. Why should I call it tridentine when the, when the city is called Trent? Oh, and it can only it's be different. Trentine. I've never heard that before. That's well, very interesting. Well, the point is, I know. That I know that Tom Fress always says tridentine, but trident, a trident is something else. A trident ah, is what is yes, what this is something uh, else. This, it is this, something this, else. This, this Greek of um, this Greek god holds up, you know. This that's trident. Right. This, uh, that's a trident. That, that has nothing to do with the, with the Council of Trent. Well, you know, it's Trent. interesting. I did look that up. Um, mm-hmm. The word in this dictionary I have. And I'll have to look at it again. It's been so long since I've seen it. I can't remember everything about it. But you're right. I mean, you know, it is the Council of Trent. It's to deal with Trent. Yeah, yeah. I didn't I didn't even look that up. It just made no sense to me to call it Tridentine because Trident has nothing to do with Trent. It is Trentine. It is from the Trent. It is we'll from look the that Council up later, of Trent. Yuri. No problem. Okay. No okay, problem. you know, it's 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 not even worth a discussion. It's no, it's just not. For me, it's not. It's not. It didn't make any sense to call it tridentine when I thought well, about it. Well, I just it. wanted to tie into it because I know I've heard Tom say it before. And, yeah, and I know. I know it's I know. the same thing. Uh, mm-hmm. It's meant to be the same thing, although it it's different. So Absolutely. Ahead, please. Dr. Paul Collins, a Catholic priest and Harvard graduate, makes the following comment about this Jesuit monstrosity called the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Quote, the Holy Office may have changed its name, but the ideology underpinning it has survived. It has certainly not changed its methods. And he adds, this body has no place in the contemporary church. It is irreformable and therefore should be abolished, unquote. Well, with this, of course, this Catholic priest's, um, uh, how do I say that, denies himself what he says here. He speaks against himself. The Roman Catholic Church is irreformable because it is the church of Satan. That is why there was no real, quote-unquote, reformation ever taking place and never will ever take place. The motto of the Roman Catholic Church is Semper eadem, always the same. The Roman Catholic Church will not change, their dogmas will not change, their policy will not change. The Roman Catholic Church is irreformable and, as he says here, should be abolished. Yeah, he doesn't mean that with the Church, he means that with the Inquisition. But you can also put that to the Church. The Church, the Roman Catholic Church is irreformable. And therefore, it can only be abolished. And when is the Roman Catholic Church being abolished? When Jesus Christ comes back and he consumes the Antichrist Antichrist with the spirit of his mouth, as is said in the Bible. Easy as that. And before that and after that, never anything else will happen. Listen, we are going to read the next two paragraphs, then we come to the Jesuit mission, the next under part of this um, Ooh. of this chapter, and uh, this is where we're going to stop. Just reading the next two paragraphs on page 128. And about Michael Bagant, I think, I hope the, I hope I uh, pronounce his name right, mm-hmm. Michael Bagant, writes that for 25 years Ratzinger was the power behind the congregation, where he served unwaveringly as enforcer of Catholic dogma and moral theology. Now he is himself exercising the papal power. According to Cardinal Ratzinger, who is later Pope Benedict XVI, one is not free, listen very, very closely, according to Pope Benedict XVI, one is not free to choose truth unless the truth means acting in accordance with with the Catholic Church's teachings. To do otherwise, says Benedict, is to embrace error. Did you get that well? Mm -hmm. Did you listen well? Shall I read it again? According to Pope Benedict XVI, one is not free to choose truth 
unless that truth means acting in accordance with the Roman Catholic Church's teaching. To do otherwise, says Benedict, is to embrace error. Thus we see that despite its reorganization and new name, the congregation still has the same role. To protect and advocate Catholic teaching on matters of faith and morals, and to search out and punish those whom it considers offenders. Article 48 of the Apostolic Constitution on the Roman Curia, Pastor Bonus, promulgated by Antichrist Pope John Paul II on June 28, 1988, states, quote, The duty proper to the congregation of the doctrine of the faith is to promote and safeguard the doctrine on the faith and morals throughout the Catholic world. For this reason, everything which in any way touches such matter falls within its competence. Unquote. And I am just out of words. Can you now see, Brett, why I was so anxious to begin the reading today? Oh, yes. Now I finally can. <laughs> <laughs> Ties it all in, doesn't it? You know, you got, moments, you got moments when you sit down and you read a book like this. You just don't want to stop. Yeah, that's I right. just don't want to stop right now, but Brett has other things to do. I have other things to do, but I just can't wait until we come back to the Ooh, table yes. and do look the next this, reading of Code Look at Barbara. this next subject, the Jesuit mission. Yeah. Yike. That's a doozy too, Yerk. We could go another hour and a half tomorrow, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I don't know we what can. time I'm going to have to work yet tomorrow, but I will try and relay that to you beforehand so you know and we can plan ahead for it, Yerk. So this time we're not... Um, wonderful and you know it is... with uh meeting up in the morning so i apologize for the other day but you know it's gonna happen maybe <laughs> once in a great while i hope not every that's time that's all right brett yeah you know it's 5 20 here right now we're gonna finish this broadcast and it's still about uh i guess seven or eight hours before i go to bed so yeah maybe we get in touch later again I, uh, let's see you can that send is an email. possible can send i am gonna be going anyway. to that library though so yeah and, and I hope um, to make good progress on that today. Good. Just and before you go, for our that, listeners, yeah. for Please. our listeners and viewers of the video, let's say goodbye on this broadcast of Code Word Babylon, which really is not scripted, as you probably learned from all the other broadcasts <laughs> too. Yeah, we just right. go along as yeah. we uh, we just make along as we go along. How do you say that? I don't know. Yeah, that's it. It's mm -hmm. it's where the Holy Spirit leads us when we come together. And here you have the uncut, the unbridled Skype recording from the very first second until the last second. And now yes, I, for want. the last second, will leave the last words to Brett Norman in this video. And I, Jörg from Joggler66, will say, say thank you very much for watching thank you very much for listening even more thanks for doing your own research and for never taking your eyes off the most important book in this world the 1611 king james authorized version of the bible that's Until next right, time Yerk. that's right absolutely right Yerk. thank you until next time god bless you bye bye and uh, I, I got in there a little early there for Yerk, uh, thanking him for his time uh, researching and looking into these matters. You know, uh, was it a uh, couple years back I decided to send Yerk the full uh, Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913, 19, I forget what years it was, um, but, yeah, the uh, edition that was published between yes. 1907 and 1913. Because I knew that there was something very special with Yerk, and he is uh, being studying with Tom Fress. And I thought that, you know, maybe this would be the best thing for him to learn more about this entire subject because i know tom had brought that up many times that he had the catholic encyclopedia so i just thought well you know 
Yerk, you know, you're um, in a very interesting position to uh, delve into these matters because of your background. You know, you come from Germany, you're living in Belgium, which is very, very Jesuit. And um, I don't even really know how Jesuit Belgium is, is because I've never been there. You know, but I'm shocked how Jesuit it is here. I never realized how Jesuit America is. And where I grew up, St. Paul, hello. <laughs> Yike. Yeah, we are really in it, Yerk. Right along with you in ways we don't even really fully comprehend yet. So... With that, we'll leave it for today on this chapter 12, Unhesitating Obedience, the General and the quote-unquote Holy Office. It's not holy to us, I guarantee you that. <laughs> and that's all for now, and blessings to everybody in our Messiah Jesus who died to save us from our transgressions that we could never blot away on our own. And... uh um, big blessings to you out there, and uh, stay focused on our Lord. Don't let this world get to you too much, <laughs> all right? And we'll catch up with you next time. Bye for now.